Hi, Professor, please. Okay, so I can start, right? Yes. Okay, hello. Okay, hello, everyone. Welcome to the SmartNet Academic Seminar. Uh, today, uh, it's my great honor to host Professor Rogers' talk. So let me introduce him first. Professor John Rogers obtained a bachelor degree both in chemistry and in physics from the University of Texas, Austin in 1989, and his PhD degree in physical chemistry from MIT in 1995. Currently, he is a Lewis Simpson and a Cambridge Query Professor of Material Science Engineering, Biomedical Engineering and Medicine, with affiliation in Medical Engineering, Electric Engineering, Electric and Computer Engineering and Chemistry at Northwestern University. And uh, he is also the director of the Query Simpson Institute for Bioelectronics at Northwestern. John has published more than uh, 750 papers and uh, is a co inventors on more than 100 patents. And he has co-founded several successful technological technology companies. His research has been recognized by many uh, prestigious awards, including the recently MRS Medal and the Benjamin Franklin Medal from the Franklin Institute. Young is a member of the National Academy of Engineering National Academy of Science, National Academy of Medicine, that's amazing, yeah. and the National Academy of Inventors, and the American Academy of Arts and Science. And uh, today is really our great honor to have him here to give us a seminar talk entitled Soft Electronics on Microfluidic System for the Skin. So without further ado, John, all floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you for that kind introduction and for the invitation to come here and uh, present some of the recent results of the, the research that we've been doing in my group. I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. So um, hopefully that looks okay. I'll just go ahead and get um, and get started. So um, what I'll talk to you about today, um, you know, corresponds to a collection of research efforts that we've had in materials and, and devices, manufacturing approaches, system level architectures for soft electronic and, and microfluidic systems that can interface gently with the surface of the skin uh, in a way that's uh, almost physically imperceptible. So almost at the level of a second skin, but one that can provide detailed clinically relevant information on health status, physiological processes, and so on. And so I'll give you a background and a little bit of a broader motivation around the kind of work that we've been doing in this area, and then focus on uh, two sets of platforms where uh, I think we've been able to make good progress over the last several years. One is in the area of skin interfaced electronics for monitoring health-related processes in neonates, tiny babies, um, and um, in, in maternal health, so, so monitoring uh, health of a, of a woman before they uh, deliver their neonate and sort of track, tracking the, those processes as well, both uh, in the uh, antepartum, the intrapartum, and the postpartum uh, periods. Uh, and then the final part of the uh, talk will uh, describe skin interface microfluidic lab on a chip type technologies for evaluating sweat rate, sweat loss, sweat chemistry in the context of sports fitness and nutrition. And so as was mentioned by Professor Chen, I'm here at Northwestern University. My home department is material science and engineering, but we do a lot of uh, biomedical engineering as well, electrical and computer engineering, chemistry, mechanical engineering with a close and intimate interface into the clinical medical community here in Chicago, and in fact, uh, around the world as well to try to develop sort of academic programs of scientific research that have the potential to lead to technologies that could improve patients' lives and, and to reduce the cost of, of healthcare is, is the over, overarching goal. So a lot of that happens through uh, traditional department structures that we have here at Northwestern University, but we also have a very unique vehicle for facilitating this style of research in the form of a center and an institute around bio-integrated electronics. It's a endowed uh, program that allows us to do things uh, at a fairly high level of technical sophistication, building devices that we can test on human patients in a statistically meaningful way. 
So that's uh, kind, kind of a background of um, you know, what I'm going to share with you uh, today. Um, at the 30,000 foot level, what, what we're really interested in more generally are biocompatible forms of uh, semiconductor device technologies, lab on a chip type technologies that um, you know, deviate from their conventional forms, which typically involve planar geometries, rigid mechanical properties, uh, inflexible sort of mechanical characteristics, physical properties that are dramatically different from those that one encounters in soft tissue systems in the living world. And one way to think about the opportunities there is to consider the brain as biology's most sophisticated form of electronics. And if you wanted to uh, learn more about how the brain operates, or if you want to manipulate neural processes in the brain, one might want to bring to bear to that problem man's most sophisticated form of electronics in the in the form of a silicon integrated circuit. But thinking about uh, you know the dramatic mismatch in physical properties of computer chips that exist today and soft tissue systems like the human brain, that really sets the stage for a number of research efforts that uh, can be directed at trying to reformulate man's types of electronic systems to look more like biologies. That, that's kind of what, what we're interested in at a high level. And, and you can think about that maybe most naturally in the context of the brain, but there are lots of other organs uh, throughout the body, essential organs to uh, life processes that could benefit from you know, microsystems technologies, not just electronics, but optoelectronics, microfluidics, microelectromechanical systems that are rendered in these kind of biocompatible tissue-like forms. And so we've done a lot in cardiac interface devices, devices that interface with the spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system, the kidney, the, the lungs, the diaphragm, the bladder, other, other systems. What I'll talk to you about today is uh, man's largest organ, which is the skin and the development of skin-like uh, microfluidic and electronic technologies that can interface gently with the surface of the skin in a way that uh, doesn't impose any mechanical constraint on natural movements of the skin, and in fact, adopt physical properties that, that are matched to those of the skin, not just the mechanical modulus, but also the thermal mass, uh, the uh, water vapor uh, permeability, and uh, other characteristics. So thinking about second skins, man-made skins that can interface with living skin and deliver to the surface of the skin advanced electronic functionality. That's kind of what we're interested in. And if you think about that in the broader context, you might consider it as a form of a wearable technology. That would be one way to envision it, but it would be sort of next, next generation wearable, radically different than the kinds of rigid blocky wearable devices that loosely couple to the wrist. And there are many examples of those types of uh, technologies, very useful in many contexts, but if you think about the uh, engineering approach, it's inherently incompatible with a persistent physical contact with the surface of the skin, which is really needed for doing all sorts of uh, routine clinical assessments of, of human uh, health status, uh, really can't be accomplished with these kinds of engineering approaches. So they're great for qualitative measurements of activity levels, for example, episodic measurements of ECG, but if you want continuous sort of intensive care unit grade measurements, you really can't do it with this kind of uh, technology. So we're really, really thinking beyond what, what comes next. And what we believe comes next are classes of devices that, as I mentioned before, have skin-like properties. So thicknesses, thermal mass values, uh, mechanical modulus values that, that are very similar to those of, of the skin. And we've developed over the years and in, in other groups as well, a number of different platforms that have those properties. And at the same time, sort of support advanced semiconductor functionality in a wireless format that allows one to uh, do ICU grade measurements of physiological status continuously and outside of laboratory or hospital settings. And so that, that's kind of the orientation around the work that we do in material science, biomedical engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering with this kind of goal in mind. So trying to set the academic scientific foundations for these new classes of technology, something we find very interesting. And there are many other groups that, that are doing great work in this space as well. Um, and so I won't get into the details because, because there's a lot of concepts that have been built up over the last 10, 15 years that, that really allow you to realize that vision. And this is the first example of that published in uh, 2011. And it's a skin-like integrated circuit that includes uh, antenna elements uh, for data transmission, inductive coils for wireless energy harvesting, arrays of silicon MOSFETs as 
the foundations for co computation and integrated circuit functionality, but also sensors. So sensors of temperature, strain, pressure, other kinds of uh, you know functions, uh, all in a, in a platform with physical properties matched to the epidermis. So so we felt like we uh, had developed an approach and a set of materials that would allow one to do this in 2011. Got a little bit better in 2014. And from that point on, we've really focused a lot of our work on addressing unmet clinical needs with these kinds of materials, with these kinds of devices, with these kinds of systems, and really trying to direct our activities toward patients who could benefit most strongly from this kind of uh, uh, technology. And I'll describe in detail, uh, you know, the patient populations that we feel fall into that category. But those uh, basic ideas form a framework into which one can insert broad classes of biosensors. And we and others have developed through hundreds of papers over the last five, six years, all kinds of different sensors that operate in thermal modalities. So for monitoring precision characteristics of thermal transport, hydration levels of the skin, electrical sensors for measuring biopotential associated with cardiac activity, muscle activity, brain activity, hydration through measurements of impedance, fluidic, I'll come back to that uh, in a little bit toward the end of the talk, where you're doing not only electronic interfaces, but also fluidic ones where we're interested in particular in sweat and the biochemistry of sweat as an alternative to more conventional biofluids, such as uh, blood serum, interstitial fluid, and urine, for example. But you can also build mechanical sensors that measure strain and motion and modulus, stiffness of the skin, pressure, pressure pulse wave, characteristics of uh, blood flow through near surface arteries, but you can also do optoelectronics. So optical measurements of the skin, oximetry, photoplevismography, vein mapping, you can measure ambient lighting conditions uh, in the context of uh, UV exposure to the skin. And then you can also do, do things to measure sounds, body sounds, mechanoacoustic signatures of internal body processes, not just uh, cardiac activity, but activity associated with the gastrointestinal tract as well. So almost like a, a stethoscope, but, but in these skin-like formats for continuous monitoring of body sounds, turns out to be very powerful. So what's all this good for? I mean, I guess is the ultimate question. Uh, one works in these types of areas because of a potential to improve patient lives. And uh, what we decided early on about 2015 is that the most compelling opportunities were in monitoring the health status of neonates, in particular, premature babies, uh, because the current technologies are extremely deficient for that purpose. They capture reliable data streams, but really awful hardware approaches that uh, are really sort of inappropriate for, for uh, patients of this sort, basically taped on biosensors that connect through hardwired interfaces to external boxes of data acquisition electronics. Works to some degree, but these tapes can cause tearing and injury to the skin when they're removed and they have to be removed on a 24-hour cycle to allow diaper changing and cleaning of the baby. The other thing is that these wires uh, impose mechanical and physical loads on the, on the babies so, th so that they can't move around very naturally. And they also frustrate engagement with, with parents because it's hard to hold your baby when they're tethered to these uh, data acquisition systems through these hard wires. So starting around 2015, we decided that uh, we wanted to direct some fraction of our academic research around solutions that would eliminate this rat, the rat's nest of wires, eliminate the invasive tapes, eliminate the hard biosensors, and replace them with these skin-like devices, wireless systems that operate in a time-coordinated fashion on relevant parts of the anatomy. And so this slide is fairly old at this point, but it really established the vision for what we were hoping to accomplish uh, with with this uh, with this research, <clears throat> and I won't go through the details. This is all described in a paper that we published in spring of 2019, and then a follow up paper that was published about this time last year. But it turns out that you can do all of that. You can take these foundational ideas in epidermal electronics and design them to reproduce what's done in even the most sophisticated neonatal uh, ICU units using these wired based systems. But now with skin like devices, two devices, one that goes on the chest. The other one that either goes on the hand or the foot, and you can reproduce everything that's done with wired based systems today without any sacrifice in data quality. And so this turns out to be very powerful. This is an example of one of the patients that we tested our technology on, about 150 such neonates. You can see the device on the chest. We're simultaneously monitoring them with our wireless skin-like devices as we are with the conventional 
wired based devices to establish quantitative equivalency. And we were able to do that and all the details are described in this 2019 science paper, but these are very tiny, very fragile uh, human beings, uh, precious in many ways. You can see a hand in this image, that's Aaron Hamvas, who's head of neonatology here at Lurie Children's Hospital where we have deep collaborations ongoing uh, in this area of technology. But it's of applicable not only to premature babies, but also infants, a little bit older set of uh, patients uh, that are in the pediatric intensive care unit. And you can see the baby here with the device on its chest. You can see the other device on the foot. So the device on the chest is measuring cardiac activity and core body temperature. So it's measuring ECG electrocardiograms. And from that, you determine heart rate and heart rate variability. You can also extract respiration rate from those data streams, temperature, core body temperature. And then the device on the foot is doing photoplethysmography. And from that kind of measurement, you can determine the blood oxygenation. And that's pretty much everything, all, all vital signs monitored in a way that uh, re really frees the babies from these invasive wired-based systems and encourages and allows for more intimate, more frequent interactions with uh, parents as illustrated here. So this turned out to be a very productive project. Uh, shortly after we published our first paper in 2019, we were contacted by program managers at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and also from the Save the Children organization, they were interested in taking these kinds of technologies and launching them in a scaled manner into lower and middle income countries, primarily in Africa, India, and Pakistan. And so we're deep into this uh, deployment, 10,000 units into India, Pakistan, Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana. And this is working out quite nicely. In order to allow that kind of deployment, however, we had to change some engineering features of the devices I just described to you, which operate, for example, in a battery-free manner, but require a transmission antenna to be placed in the base of the isolate. In these particular regions of the globe, India, Pakistan, Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana, there's no reliable source of wall plug power. So you have to use an integrated power source in the form of a rechargeable battery. And so other features of the devices needed to be modulated to uh, enable a more reliable, robust deployment into these more challenging parts of the globe. But we were able to do that, and we published all the details in a paper in Nature Medicine one year ago. And so this is a, a platform that turns out to be very powerful, multimodal data from a pair of devices that are operating in a time-synchronized fashion. So you're not only getting ECG, you're getting PPG, you're also getting cardiac sounds because we have a high bandwidth MIMS accelerometer integrated on the chest unit. You get cycles of rep respiration now, not just from the ECG, but from motions of the chest wall cavity. You get all of that data, which correlates to gold standards, but you also get time delays between the peaks in the ECG and the peaks in the PPG uh, waveforms, which uh, yield information on pulse wave velocity. So you're getting hemodynamic information that can be correlated to blood pressure. So it turns out to be very powerful. So these devices are determining all of these parameters, core body temperature, as well as the per uh, peripheral body temperature. So you can get differences in temperature from core and periphery. That turns out to be separately valuable as well. So tremendous amounts of data, big data by any definition, uh, foreshadowing the opportunity to use machine learning on these uh, data streams to determine not only the present health status, but also a predictive assessment of health trajectory into the future, I think is a very powerful direction to go. So at this point, we have a small engineering oriented startup company to execute on the Gates and the Save the Children program. We also have uh, partnerships with Drager and Anthem. We're deployed in five continents and 23 countries across neonates and pediatric patients primarily. But this is one example of a number of technologies that are entering the translational pipeline in the context of the research that we're doing at the Query Simpson Institute here at Northwestern. And so I won't go through all the details here. I'll just mention one other area that's very active for us is to think not only about the health of the neonate, but the health of the mother just before they deliver the baby. And so now we're talking about maternal fetal health and then neonatal health immediately after birth. And so the approach here is to monitor health of the mother, health of the fetus throughout the delivery process. So we have these bi this binodal pair of devices adapted from those that we developed initially for neonates, but now monitoring the health of the mother, uh, heart rate, respiratory rate, central temperature, SpO2, and peripheral temperature in those two devices. But now we've added a new module to the mix that mounts on the belly of, of the mother to monitor fetal heart rate and uterine contractions. 
So now you have a complete suite of time synchronized devices that are monitoring the health of two individuals, the mother and the unborn baby uh, in this case. And so this also turns out to work quite nicely. We can measure through a, a Doppler type of uh, approach, uh, the fetal heart rate, but we also capture uh, the maternal ECG and you can see the fetal ECG peaks uh, buried in the maternal ECG measurement. And all of these uh, measurements uh, correlate quantitatively with uh, clinical gold standards that use expensive hardwired uh, platforms that really only available in uh, the developed parts of the world, not, not in the LMICs where, where we have great interest. So these are some of the things we're doing. We've uh, now deployed these devices at scale, 487 pregnant women in Zambia throughout the intrapartum period. So we're measuring their health status, health of the fetus as the birth is occurring. And so we're beginning to develop very deep, very detailed, very high quality data bases around uh, you know, the health of an individual as they're giving birth. And this uh, turns out to be very uh, powerful in, in determining health trajectories during, during this very high risk process of, um, of birth and, and, um, and delivery. And so we're, we're now beginning to dig through the data. We just published our first paper in PNAS just a few weeks ago, but tremendous amounts of information, uh, standard information, but also novel information as well, because we can measure all of these parameters as a function of position of the mother, whether they're on their side, they're on their back, they're on the stomach. You can look at correlations, uh, ultimately with the idea of improving the way that uh, care is delivered uh, dur during uh, the birth process. So for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna uh, kind of shift gears and focus on a different type of skin interface technology platform where the functionality is really in the realm of microfluidics rather than electronics. Uh, and the idea here is to try to supplement the kind of biophysical properties uh, that are being measured uh, as described in, in, in the previous slides where you're trying to get uh, a sense of health status from physics-based measurements of physiological processes to one that's uh, based more on biochemistry. And thinking about sweat as a biofluid for assessing those biochemical biomarkers. And uh, the appeal there is that sweat can ca be captured completely non-invasively. It doesn't require penetration of the skin, which is obviously a requirement if you want to do blood analysis or you want to do analysis of interstitial fluid. And you can certainly do that, but there are all kinds of infection and pain risks associated with breaking the skin. Uh, and so we've been interested then for that reason in sweat and sweat biochemistry, and how do you capture pristine microliter volumes of sweat, and how do you analyze quantitatively the concentrations of biomarkers in sweat that could be good indicators of corresponding biomarkers in blood, for example, to sort of supplement the kinds of insights that, can one, that one can obtain with biophysical measurements alone. And so the idea is to take rigid lab on a chip type technologies reformulate them into biocompatible skin-like platforms that can then be laminated and adhered to the surface of the skin where minute amounts of sweat can be captured immediately after it emerges through pores in the sweat and in the skin surface uh, to, to allow a reliable, robust method for gaining access to biochemistry markers of health. And so the idea is to use soft elastomer materials rather than glass as the basis for the microfluidic networks and the uh, reservoirs and the, uh, and the uh, valving structures. And that's what you're seeing here. And we like silicone materials for, for that purpose, low modulus silicone materials, polydimethyl siloxane. The entire device is made using the techniques of soft lithography such that uh, openings in the base of this device form inlet ports through which eccrine gl glands through natural processes of sweat generation can pump sweat up through uh, cutouts in a thin uh, dual-sided biomedical adhesive up into these uh, inlet ports on the backside of the device where the sweat can enter this channel network and be captured in tiny reservoirs where we can do either electrochemical measurements of uh, biomarker concentrations, or even more attractive, we can use colorimetric chemistries for reading out through color change, the concentrations of uh, different biomarkers of interest. And that, that's kind of the platform, the design approach that we've been interested in. Now you can certainly integrate with this micro, soft microfluidic system, uh, skin-like electronics using approaches that I described previously, and that's certainly an option. But in many cases, just being able to cap capture sweat 
and uh, to do in situ analysis of biomarker concentrations turns out to be very powerful. And so this broader area of sweat analytics is one that's uh, of rapidly growing interest in the academic community. And so I just wanted to highlight some really great work that's happening at Berkeley. They don't use microfluidic approaches, but they use hydrogels as interfaces to the skin. And they use electrochemical approaches rather than colorimetric approaches for reading out different types of electrolyte levels, different uh, types of metabolites that are present in, uh, in, uh, in sweat. And then it's connected to Bluetooth electronics for readout and wireless data transmission. And predating that work is some uh, approaches that use NFC technologies, University of Cincinnati, really nice, nice work. And then at Seoul National, just representative uh, kinds of uh, additional efforts in sweat analysis using on skin uh, devices. And, and all of these systems represent radical technology improvements relative to traditional sweat harvesting type of uh, techniques, which typically real, uh, are realized with uh, rigid pucks uh, that are strapped tightly to the surface of the skin with uh, coiled up tubes that allow for collection of sweat for off-board analysis using benchtop uh, instrumentation. That's one way to do it. The other way is even more crude, but more widespread is just to use uh, an absorbent pad that's just taped to the surface of the skin. You can collect sweat that way, and then you can wring out that absorbent pad, extract the sweat, and, and again, use benchtop uh, instrumentation for doing uh, biochemical analysis. But, but we think our approach is unique in the sense that we're adapting all of the technologies that the lab on a chip community have developed over the last 20 years and rendering them in skin-like platforms. And this was a first example of that published in uh, 2016. This particular device has five inlet ports. One central inlet port uh, connects uh, the, the eccrine sweat to a channel that uh, runs around the perimeter of the device in this serpentine geometry. And we filled that channel with a color changing chemistry that goes from blue to red upon contact with water. And so just by visualizing the position of the fill front, you can determine the total amount of sweat lost from that local region of the skin. And it turns out that local measurement of sweat loss can be correlated to full body sweat loss as an important uh, parameter rele uh, relevant to hydration status. But the other things that you can do with this same device is you can uh, analyze the concentration of lactate, chloride, glucose, and pH through uh, colorimetric analysis in four separate reservoirs that connect to separate inlet ports on the backside of the device. And so, so we have a lactate uh, assay uh, that, that uh, is operating over physiologically relevant ranges of concentration of lactate and sweat, likewise for glucose, chloride, and pH. So a very simple device, doesn't require batteries, doesn't require any electronics built around colorimetric chemistries, soft microfluidics that provide you know, tremendous amount of information relevant to sweat. And so this works quite nicely. Uh, again, as with the electronics, the soft mechanical properties of this platform are critically important because they need to establish a watertight, robust interface to the surface of the skin, even in the presence of vigorous motions and vigorous sweating, which is likely to be uh, occurring during a physical exercise, for example. And so thinking deeply about the choices of materials, the designs that these devices allow you to build them in skin-like platforms, thereby minimizing the interface stresses that would otherwise try to uh, tend to drive delamination between these devices and the skin uh, upon uh, physical uh, deformations as, as illustrated here. So you can do all of that. Um, you know, a numerical quantitative computational capability is very important here as it is for the design of these skin-like electronic devices. And there we rely heavily on a deep collaboration that we've had for many years with Professor Yang Gong Huang here at Northwestern University. And uh, you know, through those kinds of models, they can be used as uh, design guides for, for choices of layouts and material selections for, for these devices to minimize the mechanical modulus, minimize the thickness, and therefore minimize the interface stresses associated with these devices mounted on the skin. So this is what one of these platforms looks like uh, mounted on the outer forearm of a graduate student who's involved in this work. You can see the uh, outer serpentine uh, channel. It's been filled up to about the seven o'clock position. And so again, from that fill front position and the cross-sectional geometries and the contour length of that serpentine, we can determine how much sweat has been lost from that small region of skin corresponding to about 10 uh, sweat glands roughly. And you can correlate that to full body sweat loss as 
I mentioned before. And then you have these four separate reservoirs determining lat lactate, glucose, uh, pH, and, uh, uh, and chloride uh, concentration at the same time. So here's a slightly different device showing sort of the time dynamic nature of these systems. So this is a device mounted on the inner forearm of, or forearm of my own arm while I'm exercising in my basement. And so this particular device has just a single uh, inlet port. It has a food color, a dye uh, colored uh, orange, such that when sweat enters the system, it, uh, it adopts the color of that dye, thereby facilitating visualization of the filling process of sweat as it enters the device and moves through this serpentine channel, which runs along the length of the, uh, of the device. And so by snapping pictures of the device at various time points, you can determine how much sweat has been lost at any given time uh, after the beginning of the exercise event. And so in this particular case, I worked out pretty hard up to 6.35 p.m., starting at 5.52 p.m., filled up the device. I can then analyze these pictures and determine the cumulative sweat loss as a function of exercise duration, for example. And so here I'm on an exercise bike, and I'm uh, exercising at a pretty constant metabolic rate. And so what you see is the corresponding rate of sweat release is almost perfectly constant. You have almost perfectly linear behavior of the cumulative sweat loss as a function of exercise duration. So these types of measurements are very easy to do with these kinds of skin interface microfluidics. And this kind of uh, you know, measurement has not been possible before. So I think as a discovery tool, it can yield some insights into human physiology, which, which could be important. Very, very, very simple to, to do this kind of thing. And in fact, you can uh, monitor that that kind of um, you know sweat kinematics not only in a controlled setting uh, in an exercise room on an exercise bike, but you can do it in real world settings. So as someone is playing basketball or football or tennis or even uh, aquatic sports, and this turns out to be very powerful. These devices are waterproof; they can operate underwater, no problem. And so you can measure sweat loss during swimming which is uh, really interesting because people sometimes don't realize that they're sweating quite a bit when they're in the pool, but you don't see the accumulation of sweat because it's being washed off into the pool water uh, as, as you're exercising. And so maintaining proper hydration status can be difficult in uh, aquatic sports, but, but this device sort of solves that problem. And we've been deployed on the Northwestern swim team to sort of uh, provide a more quantitative basis for rehydration you know, while, while one is exercising in the pool or competing uh, as well. So let me say a few words about the chemistry behind uh, some, some of these technologies, like, like how is this act actually working and uh, what does the color response actually look like over a physiologically relevant range for sweat? And so I'll start with chloride. That turns out to be the easiest assay. We use this silver chloranolate material. It reacts with free chloride ions in the sweat to yield a, uh, an acid uh, chloranolate ion that has a purple color. So it goes from transparent to purple, depending on how much free chloride ion is present in the sweat. And this is what it looks like from a range that spans that associated with sweat across individuals. So everybody has a slightly different level of salinity in their sweat from a low level of maybe 10 millimolars up the very high level of 125 millimolars, this is what the color looks like. It's a very vibrant, easily measured and quantitative color level that allows one to sort of quantitate uh, chloride just by image analysis using uh, digital images captured of the, of the device. And this uh, lines up very nicely with uh, HPLC measurements of chloride as sort of a gold standard. So this, this can be done very accurately very easily over, over range that's relevant for sweat. But you can do other things as well. So you can use enzymatic assays, for example, to determine the concentration of glucose. So concentration of glucose in sweat is about 100 times lower than that in blood, but there is a loose correlation. There's a little bit of a time lag, but a loose correlation. And so the, the, uh, the, the range of glucose in sweat is between 10 and 125 micromolar. But again, you can adapt these assays to yield vibrant color changes over that range uh, and, and thereby uh, establish the basis for an accurate glucose assessment in sweat. Similarly, you can use other kinds of enzymatic reagents to determine lactate concentration. The colors are different, uh, but again, you can ma make measurements over a physiologically relevant range for sweat. Other things that one can do, pH detection, very easy uh, in this case. Um, sweat is slightly acidic, typically, 
Uh, and you can use a wide range of colorimetric pH indicators to determine pH level using this same type of colorimetric uh, scheme for sweat analysis. And you can kind of see that here. But we've also been uh, interested in thinking about the other species that are present in sweat that might be interesting to think, uh, to contemplate. So nutrients as, as a, a metric for nutritional status and uh, sort of uh, an informed you know, approach to dietary intake. And so we've developed uh, assays for vitamin C, for example. Again, very vibrant change in color over a range of concentrations that are relevant for vitamin C in sweat. And we have data that indicates that the concentration of vitamin C, C in sweat tracks very nicely the concentration in blood. And so that turns out to be very powerful. You can also do other kinds of nutrients. In this case, calcium. Again, different assays, vibrant color change. You can make measurements of calcium, zinc as well. It's a little bit different uh, chemistry, but, but again, very, very powerful way to do a color-based assessment of uh, zinc concentration in sweat. And maybe more, most importantly, you can do iron uh, levels uh, in sweat as well that, that correlate nicely with ICP MS analysis using uh, sophisticated benchtop uh, analysis instrumentation. And so the, the, the scalability of the microfluidic platforms, again, leveraging everything has been learned uh, by and established by the uh, lab on a chip community over the last 20 years, allows you to do multimodal analysis as well. And so this is a patch that provides uh, a serpentine channel for measuring sweat rate and sweat loss, but then a whole array of reservoirs now that determine not only at a single time or over an average time, the chloride, glucose, pH, and lactate concentration, but to measure the time dependence of those quantities uh, by using passive capillary bursting valves. And so in this case, uh, sweat enters the device through a single inlet, and then the valve structures are designed such that each one of these reservoirs fills up in a time sequential fashion without uh, mixing. And so you can determine by looking down the uh, various columns here, how the chloride concentra concentration is changing with sweat loss or glucose, pH, lactate. And so you can make measurements of fatigability in this way. So you're running a marathon, for example, you might wanna keep track of how your chloride levels are changing so that you can replenish lost ele electrolyte uh, as needed. And so this is a, a short short movie uh, that kind of uh, shows shows what's, um, what's possible. And so, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to to do this. Uh, anyway, I have my my pointer uh, activated. Um, yeah. In, anyway, it shows shows how these uh, reservoirs are fill, filling up sequentially. So I should mention that uh, just uh, a couple of months ago, we launched a first commercial technology platform based on those ideas in a joint development effort with Gatorade. And so this is a large company, as many of you know, that sells sports beverages designed to replenish lost fluids associated with sweating, but also lost electrolytes. And so they would like to provide their customer base with some kind of quantitative indication on sweat loss so they can determine how much sports beverage they need to consume to get them back to a fully hydrated state. But they'd also like to be able to measure electrolyte levels so they can determine how much electrolyte uh, replenishment is required. And so it's really sort of two inlet ports in this, uh, in this particular case. Uh, this one uh, le leads to a straight channel that has that chloroanalyte chemistry for chloride sensing, and the other inlet connects to this serpentine channel for measuring sweat rate and sweat uh, total sweat loss. And so this device has been uh, worn by many celebrity athletes here in the U.S. Turns out to be a completely new technology that has a high relevance in, in the context of sports competition. So this is Serena Williams. Uh, in a commercial spot uh, launched by Gatorade at the end of 2018. Uh, this is Paul George of the uh, Los Angeles Clippers. You can go to the Gatorade website and you can see the device. It comes with an app. So the app you use to collect pictures of these devices for extracting the position of the color change front and also the quantitative uh, color level to determine uh, chloride concentration. And so all of this is scientifically uh, sound. It's actually a piece of scientific instrumentation that you wear. And so you determine the uh, sweat loss and sweat rate quantitatively consistent with a traditional gold standard absorbent pad based assay. And then likewise for color metric assessment of chloride concentration, it lines up very nicely with HPLC measurements of, of chloride. 
uh, with some scatter, just there's a point, a spot to spot variability uh, in the chloride level uh, is, is what we observe. But, but hundreds of uh, athletes and hundreds of uh, human subject patients have been used for these studies. And that was published in Science Advances recently. So if you're interested in picking up these devices, you can uh, order them through the web, uh, through through Gatorade's uh, website. And uh, we think it's an interesting class of technology. And uh, you know, if you play video games, it turns out you can purchase virtual devices as well. Uh, if if you're uh, uh, you know a, a, an aficionado uh, aficionado of uh, NBA 2K, you have. Uh, you know, an avatar within the game and you can go to the Gatorade store and you can buy virtual devices, which I thought was uh, ki kind of amusing uh, that they've introduced that uh, into the game uh, as well. So sports and athletics is interesting. I think uh, most of our focus though is around clinical medicine. And what do you do with sweat in clinical care? Well, it turns out that it is the standard method for screening for cystic fibrosis. And that screening typically happens uh, at very early stages of life, typically within the first six months after birth. And that kind of screening involves a collection step. So you have to induce the sweat, you have to collect the sweat, you have to extract the sweat, and you have to do the benchtop analytical instrumentation-based analysis of chloride levels in sweat. And so if the chloride level is too high, it, it uh, is a signature for a high risk of the development of cystic fibrosis. And so this is done very routinely. The problem is that it's done with a very poor technology solution. It's rigid materials, as I mentioned before, strapped to the uh, you know the forearm of a, of a baby, uh, and inside this hockey puck type device is a coiled up tube uh, that collects sweat as it emerges from the surface of the skin. You open up this uh, container, you pull out the tube after it's filled to some degree, then you extract the sweat from that tube and you insert it into this analysis instrument that gives you the chloride concentration. And so that's been the standard of care for the last 25, 30 years. The problem is the kids hate it because it's painful. You have to strap it pretty tightly to avoid leakage. And even when you do that, you end up with some level of failure associated with insufficient sample collected. And so we were contacted by pediatricians at Lurie Children's Hospital about potentially using our soft microfluidics device as an alternative that would allow for in situ analysis. You wouldn't have to use a tight strap. You could just uh, gently apply these stickers to the, the, to the skin of these babies and do, do the full analysis quickly and easily in a way that could be done not only in a hospital setting, but remotely as well in a home setting or in a lower and middle income country that doesn't have the kind of hospital infra infrastructure that we have here in the US and that is also present in China. So this is uh, an example of one of the devices developed for that purpose. We've done about 100 babies through Lurie Children's here in Chicago. We haven't seen any failures at all. These are very gentle. They just self-adhere to the surface of the skin. They have these fluid channels, reservoirs, chloranolate chemistry works very nicely. And so we published th those results just a few weeks ago in Science Translational Medicine, if you wanna see more about that. Uh, you can pull up that paper and re read about it. But it's been a great project. We've done benchmarking against these standard uh, hockey puck type devices. Works very nicely. Uh, you put some graphics on these devices and the kids love them. Uh, and so it makes uh, the nurse's job a lot easier uh, engaging with these patients and, uh, and collecting and analyzing sweat. And so the, the, all the quantitative data, as I mentioned before, is in this science translational medicine uh, paper. So that's kind of the status. And uh, what we're looking at uh, now into the future is kind of combining skin-like electronics with skin-like microfluidics. So in a single platform, you can do biophysical analysis of health status. You can do biochemical analysis of status as well and develop a rich, diverse set of measurements around uh, the health status of, of, of a patient. And uh, you know, this was a first example of one of those hybrid type of systems. And uh, we've used NFC electronics magnetically coupled to a single use microfluidic platform. So the electronics can be used multiple times. The uh, fluidics is designed to be low enough in cost that it, it, it only needs to be used a single time. And so we're combining colorimetric assays with electrochemical assays uh, to provide a very broad uh, set of capabilities in a single small device. It's about the size of a U.S. quarter, but it offers a wireless interface to pretty much any, any smartphone these days with, with the NFC uh, hardware that's built into those uh, platforms. So that, that's kind of where we're going. Um, and then as one uh, yet 
you know, uh, additional advance where we're uh, integrating Bluetooth electronics. So there you need a battery, uh, but it allows a, a longer range communication channel uh, that allows one to use, for example, smart watch uh, with, with one of these kinds of skin interface microfluidic devices. It's a small reusable module, Bluetooth electronics, a coin cell battery. It's measuring the properties of sweat and continuously transmitting the results of those measurements to a, to a smart watch. Uh, in this case as, as kind of a future direction that we think is uh, pretty exciting. So with that, I think I'm almost out of time. I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, wrap up. So <clears throat> I try to provide you with a very high level description of some of the work that we've been doing in skin-like microsystems technologies, both electronics, microfluidics, integrated electronic and microfluidic systems and thinking about these technologies as uh, you know, the way of the future, uh, I think, for uh, for healthcare, both both in a hospital setting and, and remotely, digitally enabled using advanced materials, mechanics, manufacturing approaches, and device designs. So I'll conclude by uh, highlighting some of the senior collaborators that are involved, have been involved in this work. We're a very collaborative group, uh, both with uh, groups in engineering science, as well as in clinical medicine and sports. So these, these are some of the senior investigators that have been really important in the, in the work that I've, I've described to you today. Uh, but also, you know, and probably most importantly are the students, the, the postdocs, the graduate students, the undergrads who are involved in this work. This is a picture of the group from summer of 2018. So pre-pandemic, but uh, it's a really talented uh, collection of individuals, great ideas, really, really hardworking people. And it's a real honor for me to be able to, to work with them on these type, types of projects. So with that, I'll go ahead and conclude and I'd be happy to answer questions if, if there are any. Okay, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for your wonderful and uh, inspiring talk. It is really inspiring not because of the eye-opening ideas and also the uh, technical content, but also the research philosophy that you're always trying to bring the scientific research to practical products and uh, to really change the world. That's amazing. So, oh, uh, so here I have a number of questions from my audience. So, uh, I'm the messenger <laughs> to pass a question to you. So, the some of the audience ask you. So, for the epidermal electronics, because when you uh, wear this device against the uh, human skin, but human skin usually has hair and the uh, wrinkles. So, how to reduce? those negative impacts, the possible negative impact, uh, potential negative impact from those uh, wrinkles on a human skin health? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I didn't include an image in this particular slide, but um, <clears throat> if you make these devices very, very thin and very soft, they can conform to the wrinkles of the skin. The natural wrinkles of the skin uh, typically are not a problem. There may be certain instances where it could be challenging, let's say on the elbow where you have very deep wrinkles or maybe certain regions of the knees, but on the forearm, the inner outer forearm, the hands, the neck, the chest, uh, wrinkles tend not to be a problem because of the soft mechanics can sort of conform to the, the geometry of those wrinkles. Um, and I think a similar consideration applies to the, the hair. So the hair could be viewed as some topography, just like the wrinkles are. And the, the devices, the materials can kind of conform to the hair to some, some degree. So it seals around the hair, I guess, in, in a sense. And so, so it's typically not a problem. <laughs> there are certain cases where uh, you know, the, the hair coverage is very dense, it would be an issue. Um, we typically don't see that as a problem, but for example, if you wanted to laminate one of these devices onto your head, like right onto the hair of your head, uh, it would not work uh, properly. So there are limits to the ability of these devices to conform to wrinkles and to hair, but in most cases, it's not a prohibitive issue. It comes back to the idea of smart materials design uh, to to allow you know not only natural motions with stretching and deformation of the skin, but even the static topography, uh, you know that that's also simultaneously addressed through the use of soft elastomeric materials. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for your uh, answering. So there is another question from the audience that is uh, for the work of uh, folks on the wearable sweat sensing uh, during human swimming. Do you think the water in the pool would cause the interference to the sensing singular transmission or the measurement accuracy? Yeah, that, that's another Another great question. So <clears throat> the presence of the pool water doesn't have any effect on the uh, color metrics. So if you're using a Bluetooth module, for example, for wireless data transmission, the water could be a problem. <clears throat> Probably not a big problem unless you're trying to uh, transmit data while you're uh, deep underwater. I think uh, shallow depths uh, would not be a problem even for, for Bluetooth. Uh, but for the device I'm showing right here, there's no embedded electronics at all. And so data transmission and interference associated with the electromagnetic properties of the water uh, are not a problem. Now, the, the other question, though, is to what extent could the pool water enter into the device? And um, in principle, you might think of that being a potential issue because um, there are outlets to these devices to allow trapped air to escape. Otherwise, it's very difficult for the sweat to enter the devices. So there is an outlet port in every one of these devices. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out that the air that's within the channels prevents the backfilling of pool water into the devices. These channels are very small, not very small. They're sub-millimeter in cross-sectional dimensions. And so the pool water cannot enter into the device through the outlet chamber because of the presence of the air that's in the unfilled parts of the uh, microfluidic structure. So we have never seen a problem associated with backfill of uh, pool water into the devices. So there's really no contamination in that sense. And the, um, and the colorimetric readout, like I said before, is uh, unaffected by, by the presence of the surrounding water. Okay, thank you for your answering. So I'm reading another question from the audience. So they're asking you, so uh, because the uh, perspiration rate from a specific person is changing as, uh, over the time. So this kind of a uh, perspiration rate change could, uh, uh, does it show kind of impact on the measurement ac accuracy of the sweet analysis? Yeah, that, that's another great question. So. There are some studies that indicate the chloride concentration, for example, can be different depending on the sweat rate. Uh, other biomarker concentrations can also depend on the sweat rate. And so it's very important to be able to measure sweat rate for that reason. So I think a microfluidic approach is, is one that's going to be essential in this area of sweat analytics because, because that rate information is needed in order to accurately interpret the meaning of the concentration of the biomarker that, you, that, you're, uh, that you're measuring. So that's one level of answer to this question. The other answer is a little bit more practical. So <clears throat> can you develop a device that's one size fits all in the sense that the channel geometries are such that there's, there's a visual extent of filling into the channels across all pay, uh, individuals, but also the device is designed so that it doesn't overfill for certain individuals that are high sweaters, that have high rates of sweating. And so that turns out to be a bit of a challenge because for example, <clears throat> kids don't sweat very much, children don't sweat very much, and generally women sweat much less than men. And so the question is, how do you develop a single device that can apply to everyone in a broader population? Older people sometimes don't sweat very much either. Yeah. And so what we've uh, worked on, and we have not published this yet, uh, is an approach that uses a channel structure where the cross-sectional dimensions of the channel vary continuously along the length of the serpentine structure that defines the channel. So you start out with a very small cross-section so that even okay. a very small amount of sweating fills that part of the channel structure by a, an amount that's easily visualized. But as the sweat continues to fill the system, even if it's being 
introduced into the device at a constant sweat rate, it's filling the channels at a sublinear speed in terms of motion of the fill front. So it creates a, a way to address very wide range of sweaters, very wide range of sweat rates, such that even very low sweat rates can be measured accurately. But very high weight rates of sweating don't lead to overfilling of the device. So it's two ways to answer that question, which is which is a very good good question. So this is really a creative idea. Yeah, thank you for your sharing. Yeah. So uh, here's another question from the audience. So, um, so to your uh, in your opinion, so what is the main challenge of the devices, especially the epidermis electrons, to get the FDA approval? Yeah, so we're in the middle of that approval process right now. So we don't yet have approval, but I think we're within one to three months of receiving approval. We've been working with the FDA for the last nine months. It's been a little bit slow because of the pandemic, but we have plenty of data that we've already published to establish equivalency between data collected with our devices and traditional hospital equipment. And so for FDA, that's all you need to do. There's some other um, <clears throat> requirements around device robustness and electromagnetic interference and risks for electrical shock and mechanical damage. And you have to do a lot of those kinds of studies. It's a, it's a lot of work, but fundamentally all you need to show is that your device is generating data streams that are equivalent to those created by hospital apparatus today. So that's the starting point, is to try to gain FDA approval for traditional measurements. But once you've done that, now you have an FDA approved platform that you can begin to use for novel measurements. And I think that's a really powerful frontier direction. So for example, with uh, neonates, the chest unit is measuring heart sounds that's already done with stethoscopes, so we can already do the comparison, the FDA approval around heart sounds. But the other information that you get from that same sensor are sounds of vocalization. So you can think about crying as a novel biomarker. It's the way that the infant is communicating to the outside world. And so what can you determine from measurements of tonality or or frequency or cadence of crying. And by using these devices to measure crying, it's much different than using a microphone because you're measuring vibrations of the uh, surface of the skin. You're not measuring ambient noises. So you can uh, accurately capture crying dynamics of the patient who's wearing the device independent of noises that may be happening in the room. Like a, a NICU is a very noisy place. You got lots of babies crying all over the place. So just using a traditional microphone doesn't work, but using these high bandwidth accelerometers is a very powerful way to measure vocal biomarkers. Just as one example of many, many other types of measurements that you can make with these devices that are going beyond what's done today, even in a very sophisticated NICU like we have here in Chicago. So we're thinking about not just making NICUs wireless, enhancing the safety of the pa uh, patients, enabling more intimate and more frequent engagements between parent and child, but we're thinking about NICU of the future, where you're measuring everything you do today, plus a lot of other stuff as well. And uh, using all of those data streams together with machine learning to develop deeper insights into health status than is possible with the kind of data that's collected today. So, so I think FDA is a starting point. And then once you have that, a whole very powerful frontier direction opens up. Uh, and people in the academic community who are developing individual sensors, it becomes very compelling because now you can imagine inserting those sensors into these platforms, making them multimodal, measuring lots of different things. And so I think it serves as a very strong motivation for developing novel sensors. Uh, novel ways to measure health status, babies, expecting mothers, all sorts of vulnerable patient populations. Uh, I think it cr creates a very powerful frontier. Okay, thank you very much, John. Thank you very much for your answer with 
a lot of details. Um, so due to a time limit, so here I just, uh, there's a number of uh, uh, question of there, but here I just pick one last question, maybe some of the audience that concern the most. That is, so when you uh, look, when you're hiring a postdoc or PhD student, so what a characteristic, personal characteristic that is your look at the most? Um, I typically don't look at detailed expertise as much as I do um, passion and energy and focus and excitement about research. And for my group in particular, excitement for the kinds of research programs that we're interested in. So not everybody likes this stuff, but a lot of people do. And I think having passion is is the most important thing because uh, research is hard. And uh, if you're not excited about it, if you're not dedicated to it, it's very difficult to be successful. So probably interest and passion and energy level, that's a number one set of considerations. I don't think you have to be smart. You have to have a, you know, a strong academic record. You have to have published papers. Papers, you have to have gotten great grades and all of that sort of stuff. But but I think what sets certain people apart is their um their energy level and their enthusiasm and their excitement for this kind of uh work. And so that's kind of what I look at. I assume that they've already established an ability to publish papers. I assume that they've gotten great grades. I assume that they have great letters of recommendation, but it's that other piece. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not, you know, and uh, and that's really what we look for. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful talk and also uh, the answers with a lot of details and the helpful information. I think uh, that's much of our uh, seminar talk today. Thank you once again, John. Yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much. Take Hi, care. John. Okay. Thanks for your...